All right, I um, am happy to see you. We're starting our next panel on um, home and um, neighborhood and community. Um, and it's uh, my pleasure today, I'll be able to introduce our um, wonderful moderator, who will then guide you through the rest of the morning's um, program. As we said in the beginning, we'll hear our speakers. We'll have a break in the middle of them to do some more swipe questions. So if you want to look on your table tent and see what the site is going to be and do your phone ahead, you can or you can wait. So we're very um, happy today to um, have such an interesting group of people and uh, be able to talk about realizing our children's potentials in their homes, neighborhoods, and communities. And um, for our moderator, we have um, Erica Anthony, who is the Vice President of Government Relations and Strategy for Cleveland Neighborhood Progress. She's the co-founder of Cleveland Votes and Hack Cleveland and sits on a number of boards in the Cleveland area. And so I will tell you from personal experience, when something important is happening around children and the community, you see Erica right there. And so she is an important presence in our community. She's also an adjunct professor teaching a course on policy at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel. Uh, School of Applied Social Sciences at um, Case Western Reserve. So Erica is a native New Yorker, but somehow we were fortunate enough to get her here uh, to Cleveland, working tirelessly on behalf of Cleveland's neighborhoods and the children and families who live in them. And so um, without further comment, let's welcome Erica and the panel. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, so as Jill said, my name is Erica Anthony. Uh, before I introduce our panel, I just want to provide a little bit of framing to this conversation, uh, just so you got, start to get an idea of what you will hear from our esteemed panelists. Um, but I would be remiss if I did not honor and thank uh, the Schubert Center for their hard work, Gabriella, Jill, Samantha, and the many, many others that I know helped to put this event on today. Um, I know it's been a great day and will continue to be so. So thank you for your hard work. Um, so this question uh, we've been sitting with for, or I've been sitting with for quite a couple of months now, um, what does it mean to realize the potential of our neighborhoods as it relates to children? Um, it's a heavy and complex question, uh, but first, uh, the first steps towards solution is educating ourselves on the nuances of the issue. Um, and I'm grateful that the panelists today will highlight uh, the state of affairs here in Cleveland, the challenges, um, and, and also the opportunities for hope as it relates to our children. Our panelists will examine the aspects of this question, um, but before we get there, I do want to provide some brief framing on how critical this issue is, not just for our entire nation, but for specifically the city of Cleveland. In 2015, the Children, excuse me, the Child Opportunity Index was released by the Brandeis University's Heller School of Policy and Management. It's a scale that evaluates neighborhoods on all the conditions and resources available for kids for healthy physical, social, and cognitive development. One of the project's key findings is that there is a disproportionate share of minority children living in unhealthy neighborhoods. In fact, about 40% of black children and 32% of Hispanic children reside in a neighborhood that do, do, excuse me, do not do well on the Child Opportunity Index. If you're interested in learning more about this index, you can find it at datakids, datadiversitykids.com. Um, but on the other hand, only 9% of white children live in such a neighborhood. So let me just say that one more time. About 40% of black children and 32% of Hispanic children reside in a neighborhood that does not do well according to this index. And on the other hand, only 9% of white children live in such a neighborhood. While the data on the national level um, is stark uh, and hard to absorb, today you'll learn about the welfare of the children here in the city of Cleveland and how it relates to their opportunity or lack thereof. While listening to the presentations today, I ask you to ponder this question um, as you hear from our esteemed panelists. How will we as a community reclaim the destiny of the children in the city of Cleveland? So now on to our panelists. 
I am very honored to introduce the first three panelists, Dr. Robert Fisher. All bios, full bios are available in your program, so I'm just going to give their titles um, and the title of their presentation for purposes of brevity. Dr. Robert Fisher, Associate Professor of Social Work and Co-Director of the Center on Urban and excuse me, on urban poverty and community development at the Mandel School at Case. His presentation is entitled Legacy of Collective Disadvantage in Childhood Throughout Housing Policy, an Equity Approach. To my left. Next, we have Dr. Elizabeth Benninger, research psychologist and community practitioner and collaborator with the Youth Opportunities Unlimited. Her presentation is recognizing how structural barriers create opportunity deserts and strategies for youth economic empowerment. Next, we have Zuma Zabala, CEO, President of East End Neighborhood House, and her presentation is Cultural Humility in Promoting Healthy Neighborhoods, the Settlement House of Intergenerational Model. What we'll do, we'll have a few minutes from each panelist to go over their presentations. As Jill indicated, we'll take a brief break um, to do the swipe questions, and then we'll have our remaining panelists. Thanks again for joining us. Should I keep going? Yeah, so actually, <clears throat> we were going to start out with just the home and neighborhood portion of that. Go ahead and start the presentation. OK. Uh, good morning. I'm Rob Fisher, and I'm pleased to be with you this morning. Uh, we're going to start off uh, uh, the panel talking a little bit about the uh, context in regard to housing and, and neighborhoods, which we know to be so important for uh, child uh, development and certainly their broader family, but I, the the framing for this and and I, I don't want to uh, under underscore the importance of what we're really talking about is victimization of children by their environment and uh, the the serious uh, condition that we uh, currently have for our children in Cleveland and has existed for a while. So I'm going to be talking about the role of housing. But we, coupled with that role of housing, is uh, the issue of, of lead exposure. So just to set the stage, uh, I want to review a couple uh, items uh, on lead exposure in the city and county. Uh, presented here are longitudinal uh, yearly data on testing uh, of children under age six in Cuyahoga County and the city of Cleveland. And this is the percentage of tested children that uh, tested positive for lead uh, in each year. Uh, these, uh, what you can see is, in general, a very favorable trend, declining percentages. In, in the county, we test about 20 to 23,000 children a year uh, under age six. Uh, and what, what we've seen is this decline in annual uh, positive testing, positive uh, confirmed lead of children. The two upper uh, lines there show you the testing at the five micrograms per deciliter level of lead exposure, which is the current standard. And the two lines below that show you the uh, previous standard, which was 10 micrograms per deciliter. So in general, if you just look at the top dark line there, we, in back in 2004, about 42% of children in the city of Cleveland that were tested, tested positive for lead. Uh, the current statistic as of 2015 was 13%. So we have seen this steep decline, and I think that's something that we should, that, that is certainly the trend we want to see. But we have to consider another dimension of this, and that is not how many kids test positive in a year, but how many kids test positive by a certain time in their life. So these data follow children by their birth cohort. So the one closest to me are children born in 2001. And it asks the question, how many of them tested positive by age one, two, three, four, five, six? And so again, uh, if you look at the closest set of bars uh, to me, uh, you'll see that about 50% of the children that were born in 2001 t ever had a positive lead test by the time they reached kindergarten. And moving to the right, you can see uh, for the children that were born in 2008, the far right set of bars, 25% of them had tested posit had a positive test. And so our, our belief here is that any positive lead test prior to kindergarten is 
as, as a neurotoxin, as a brain insult, that this is a, a damage that is carried forward into every learning environment that the child is exposed to. And something that we have to be not just cognizant of, we have to proactively respond to, certainly in prevention, but also in intervention with children as they arrive in different, different spaces. The other, the other part of this is the geographic dispersion. So we, those rates I just showed you were at the level of the city and the county, but we have high concentration of lead exposure of children in certain neighborhoods. In, in some neighborhoods, uh, that 50% is currently the norm, 50% exposure of ch uh, lead exposure for children. Whereas in others, it's in the, in, in the teens or single digits. So we, it's, it, is a, it is a matter of uh, geographic dispersion, and you would not be surprised by the neighborhoods that are partic where the children are particularly exposed to these concerns. So that's the, that's the backdrop for what I'm going to share with you. Uh, and this, the, f the focus of the, these results is on both accounting for housing and lead exposure and how that impacts whether children are prepared for school when they arrive at kindergarten. And this was work that was funded uh, by the MacArthur Foundation under their strategy trying to understand the role of housing and child development. And so as part of this study, we were really going after how if, uh, the, the quality of the child's home, the qu quality of the child's neighborhood, and how those impact their kindergarten readiness. So if you look at a, a conceptual kind of version of this, across time, certainly we know that a variety of child and family characteristics are predictors of, of readiness for school. But in the center portion there, you see a number of things that we tried to account for in our study. The quality of the child's house, the quality of the neighborhood they lived in, uh, and then some other factors that we know are also related, including child maltreatment, lead exposure, and mobility. And so we used a, a model to include all these factors in the prediction of kindergarten readiness. The sample that we're using here is four years of kindergartners arriving in Cleveland schools, about uh, 14,000 children uh, who arrived at Cl Cleveland kindergartners. And some demographics here on the sample, 69% uh, were African American. I just want to point out a few things here. 70, uh, on average, uh, these children spent 75% of their time prior to kindergarten living in poverty. 66% uh, of them uh, of their time before kindergarten was spent living in a neighborhood with concentrated disadvantage. Uh, we looked at the quality of the house the children lived in. So, for you, you heard if you were at the previous session, you heard reference to our integrated data system. The strategy behind this study was to actually use administrative data to, to identify every uh, property, every address a child had lived in prior to kindergarten. We created an address file, and then we linked those addresses to property level information that we have from our NeoCanDo system at, at uh, the Poverty Center. And we could look at the quality of the house they lived in and its risk factors, but also the other homes in their neighborhood within a buffer of 500 feet. So a few things to keep in mind. 15% uh, of these kids lived in uh, at a property that had a tax delinquency. Uh, in terms of the houses around their family home, uh, within 500 feet on average, they had 10 other properties with a tax delinquency, about three that were in foreclosure. Uh, another three that were owned by a speculator. These are all markers of risk in the housing market of the stability of, of these. So let me jump ahead to uh, the overall results. And that is we, what we already knew. We knew that both lead exposure and, and uh, housing risk are both predictive of kindergarten readiness. And what this graphic shows you is the kindergarten readiness score on the left-hand side, uh, and across the bottom is basically how distressed the neighborhood they lived in was. And the difference between the two lines was whether the child was had a confirmed lead exposure. So in sum, what this says is, if you live in a bad neighborhood, 
you could lose as much as one and a half points on your kindergarten readiness score. If you're lead exposed, you could lose another point. So if you live in a bad neighborhood, distressed neighborhood, and are lead exposed, that's about two and a half points off your kindergarten readiness score. What does that mean? That means that your odds of passage at third grade on the reading test are cut by basically one third. The, the intervention effects that we find from high quality preschool like UPK and CMSD preschool basically increase children's scores by about three points. So these housing effects are, and lead effects are equivalent to what we can see on the positive side for interventions. So that's, that's, the, that's the sum here is we, have to, we must bring together our housing and neighborhood folks in the discussion with early childhood and our school partners in order to, to uh, increase collaboration across these spaces. And I'll stop there, thank you. Hello everyone, good morning. Um, I'm Elizabeth Benninger and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about um, a variety of structural barriers that influence the opportunities for young people to, um, to have economic success. Motion, it's not soap, it's not lotion, it's motion. Motion is a two-in-one um, body wash and lotion product, which was developed by a teenager from the west side of Cleveland. Kendra never really saw herself as a businesswoman or an entrepreneur. She grew up with a rough family life and in a neighborhood where she saw um, a lot of conditions of poverty. That was until she joined the East City program. East City is an entrepreneurship education program that is sponsored by Youth Opportunities Unlimited. Um, they teach entrepreneurship skills and business skills in high schools throughout Cuyahoga County. Um, so when Kendra joined the program, she had access to an entrepreneurship teacher who mentored her through the process of developing her business motion. This business took her to a citywide competition in Cleveland where she won first place as an entrepreneur. Um, in addition to that, she was able to move on to a national competition in New York City. Although um, Kendra's outcomes were very favorable, today she's a sophomore at the University of Akron and continues to develop and grow her business motion while working on her degree. The same outcomes were not evident in all of the students. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about why that is. The sociocultural self model talks about the transactional relationship between individuals and their environment. Institutions, cultures, and history all shape the way children are treated, and this treatment often becomes internalized in a sense of self. And this sense of self can limit opportunities for young people to, to be successful. So, Let's backtrack a little bit to the history of Cleveland's neighborhoods, building off of this model. Misguided historical policies still hold a negative impact on Cleveland's residents today. The residual effects of racial zoning and redlining have resulted in the current status of many of Cleveland's most impoverished neighborhoods, which I will refer to as opportunity deserts. The Homeowners Loan Corporation was created in 1933 to assist with the refinancing of homes subsequent to the Great Depression. However, the refinancing manifested in the form of residential security maps, or redlining maps, which guided city investment. These maps rated black and immigrant neighborhoods with a low grade um, rate regarding investment desirability, limiting residents' access to mortgage insurance or credit. The impact of this disinvestment is still evident in the geography of opportunity in many of Cleveland's neighborhoods today. Historically, redline neighborhoods tend to experience greater challenges as it pertains to neighborhood infrastructure and in turn, economic opportunity. So let's jump ahead and see the condition of these very same neighborhoods today. Poverty in Cleveland. The poverty rate in the city of Cleveland is at 35%. Even more shocking, 
For children, it's at 52.5%. You can see that um, by this map, oh, sorry, um, that it's condensed in the same neighborhoods which were marginalized through redlining. Infant mortality is an important component of understanding the well-being of, of, a, of a community and the factors which impact the local children and youth. You can see on this map of Cleveland's black neighborhoods versus the more affluent white neighborhoods that infant mortality affects black babies at a rate of three times higher than white babies. Black babies in the city of Cleveland are dying at a rate of three times higher than that of white babies and it's amongst the highest in the entire country. Teenage pregnancies are as high as 45 per 1,000 live births in the city of Cleveland. During my short time assisting with the East City program, uh, we had several teens who fell pregnant and had to drop out of school and out of the program as a result of this pregnancy. Children born to adolescent mothers are more likely to be born prematurely and at a low birth weight, increasing the risk of um, infant mortality, respiratory problems, other chronic physical illnesses, and also developmental disabilities. These kids are more likely to repeat grades in school, less likely to graduate from high school, and are more likely to become teen parents themselves. Um, in these same neighborhoods, um, they're also considered food deserts, which mean neighborhoods that lack access to healthy and um, fresh foods. And uh, I would say by no coincidence, the life expectancy in, this, in these neighborhoods are, is 10 years less than the more affluent white communities. So the life expectancy is on average 72 years old, and in more affluent communities around Cleveland, 82 years old. So in addition to the things that I just mentioned, um, I noticed a number of barriers that prevented certain students from obtaining um, success. Um, these included a lack of uh, stability in the home, minimal support networks, school and neighborhood violence, um, levels of literacy, economic resources to continue their businesses, um, and also um, not enough funding to help support the entrepreneurship program. However, there were also a variety of factors which contributed towards the success of these young people, um, especially the quality of a consistent mentor to help them build their businesses and to support them when other um, environmental factors were not being supportive. In addition to that, it was their levels of self-efficacy and their um, sense of self that they constructed around being a successful entrepreneur. So in conclusion, YOU and other nonprofits seeking to empower young people throughout Cleveland are definitely needed. However, a holistic approach must be taken, which takes into consideration the history um, and its current impact, levels of poverty that are affecting these students. So in other words, young people need the opportunity to develop an identity around being an entrepreneur, but they need the social structures and resources in place to support that sense of self. Thank you. Hello, everyone. You know the title. OK, so I'm here to talk to you about our practice at East End. So East End is 111 years old. It's a multi-service organization that services a multi-generational community. And we do so also. Um, we also have intergenerational approaches because we understand that a child is connected to its family and its community. And we do the practice of servicing them in the spirit of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu very simply means that we see each other in each other. Um, that, that, that Ubuntu is exactly what actually drives our cultural humility when we provide the service, meaning that we see the person. We see who they are, daring to see who they are originally, um, 
and I'm sorry, but seeing the whole of the person, that means that we are able to um, assist them with what they present to us, right? You may not know who they are, or what they've experienced, but you are listening to their story. Cultural competency, and, and on the other hand, can kind of make you think that you're already in the know and you know the answers, and therefore you begin to prescribe what you believe that is good for the family. We have various values at East End that help us drive that cultural humility work. But what I want you to focus on is our number one value, and that is to drive our practice with compassion. And acknowledge the origin of the challenges that a family presents to you with the intent of providing an approach that is equitable. That means that your lens has to be their lens, right? What they bring to the table is actually how you're going to provide that service of equity, meaning that racial equity here is also very important. So I went on a journey with 12 mothers at East End that we service, and we service them and we service their children. And I asked them to put themselves first, a notion that was even, you know, surprising to them. And so I share with them the, the, the rule of the mask on the plane, right? Who do we put the mask on on the plane first? We put it on ourselves, right? Not the child. And so I'll let them tell you themselves about the journey that they took with us to see what they wanted to do with their own lives without us prescribing to them what they wanted for their families and their children. Again, because we understand that a child is connected to a family, is connected to a community. And here's what they have to say. How do you make it talk? Yes, the 
one where the Zuma had gave us um, these questionnaires that um, have like other um, our peers or family members or coworkers to answer about ourselves. So I want to see like the viewpoint from others to see like if it matches up how, how I view myself. And it was very um, aligned, you know, the response from individuals. Something I think for myself is to be a professional basketball coach on the college level. I love basketball. I played it all my years. So it may seem simple. Uh, oops. It may may seem simple. My message may me, may seem simple, but what we're saying is that you have to see the person, and you have to understand that person is connected to a community, is connected to a family. The different life stages in life is going to bring different challenges. Therefore, when we're designing solutions, our solutions have to be multifaceted and non-judgmental. We have to see the person, we have to see their culture and where they're come from. So you know how they tell you that coffee's good for you, but then they tell you it's bad for you, and then they tell you it's good for you again? Well, I'm Puerto Rican, I still think it's good no matter what. <laughs> but my point here is that East End Neighborhood House has been servicing the community like this for 111 years. We believe to be a best practice. And like coffee, we're still good for you. <laughs> All right, let's give another round of applause for our first set of panelists. All right, next we have Swipe. I don't know about y'all, every time I hear it, I think of Dora the Explorer, swipe or no swiping, swipe or no swiping. <laughs> She wasn't even of my era. I'm too old for Dora, but I have nieces and nephews that watched it uh, 120 million times. So anywho, um, so you've done this before. You were in the earlier session. Uh, we'll advance through five questions. I'll answer first, and then uh, we'll, we'll be able to populate your responses. And then um, our student volunteer uh, will advance to the next question. So the first question is, do you think Cleveland's strong sense of neighborhood identity is primarily an asset or can it be more of an obstacle to our city coming together as a community committed to our children? Your options are mostly a strength, creates more barriers, is irrelevant. I know there's more than 14 of y'all in here. Come on now. <laughs> People are toggling, okay. All right, looks like we're, oh no, we still have more coming in, okay. I feel like we need to have the Jeopardy music in the background. <laughs> do, 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 do. We'll give it about another 30 seconds, just in case folks are still getting on to the question app. So we have a couple still coming in, but it generally looks like uh, most people believe that it is mostly a strength. So we'll advance to the next question. Childhood lead poisoning is a multifaceted social problem, but if you have to identify the driving issue, do you see it primarily as a public health issue, neighborhood and housing issue, policy issue, corporate irresponsibility issue, poverty issue, or all the above? <laughs> Policy is in my title, so y'all should have known where I was going. <laughs> all right. 
Oh, y'all Johnny on the spot now. Everybody's on the app, huh? <laughs> um, with 46 <laughs> votes in, looks like a uh, majority of folks here think it's all the above. Great, next question, please. Compared to 10 years ago, how violent do you think our city is? Your options are less violent, more violent, about the same. All right. With about 43 votes in thus far, 44 looks like a majority of the room feels like it is more violent. Next question, please. Which of the following do you believe is the most important strategy for reducing violence in Cleveland? Your options are increasing educational and job <coughs> opportunities for all, reducing the impact of structural racism in promoting inclusiveness, addressing inequities by improving police, justice, and community relationships, strengthening professional skills in responding to childhood trauma, reducing gun violence through policy, stronger law and order policies, including more police on the streets. All right, with about 40-ish votes in, looks like majority of the room feels that increasing educational and job opportunities for all is the option. Our last swipe question for today. To what extent do you believe Cleveland ensures all of our children are adequately cared for and protected? I believe Cleveland is, and this is a fill in the blank, switching it up, in caring for and protecting our children, excuse me, in protecting our kids. Your options are excellent, somewhat effective, not effective enough, but striving to improve, all talk, little action. All right. So it looks like folks believe not effective enough, but striving to improve. So thank you so much for participating in our Door of the Explorer swipe segment. <laughs> Next up, to round out our session, we have our next three presenters. Abigail Stout is the managing attorney of the Housing Practice Group at the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. Her presentation is Getting the Lead Out of Childhood, Legal Strategies for Fighting Lead Exposure. Next, we have Dr. Scott Frank. He is the director of, Ma excuse me, the director of Master in Public Health Program at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. And his presentation is Youth as the Front Line to Violence Prevention, Sharp Clee. Last but not least, we have Makit Sabur with the Center for Fatherhood and Family Dynamics. And his presentation is Strong and Healthy Families as Building Blocks for Strong and Healthy Communities. Please welcome our next set of panelists. Good morning. morning. Shanae and her young child were looking for a new place to live. They located a nice, cute um, upper in a, an up-down, called up the landlord and asked for um, a chance to look at the place. The landlord took her around the unit as she held her six-month-old daughter, and she liked it. Hardwood floors, cute fireplace, nice bathroom with a uh, clawfoot tub. It was cute, she liked it, and the price was right, so she, she rented it. About two months after she moved in, she received a notice from the De Ohio Department of Health. The notice told her that in 2007, there had been a child who had been living at that house who was poisoned by lead, that the um, Department of Health had conducted an inv investigation, and they identified lead hazards throughout the unit. There was no record of these lead haz hazards ever being remediated. Shanae, um, sorry. So there was this list of all of the places in the units um, 10 years ago, basically, where there were lead hazards. 
Shanae knew she had to do something. She had this young child who she knew was at risk of um, exposure to the lead hazards. So she called legal aid. Cleveland, as we've heard today, has a pretty serious lead problem, as most cities do. This is largely in part to um, over 10,000 children have been poisoned um, in the last five years. And it's largely in part due to the, the rental stock of housing. It's mostly pre-1978. Much of it is actually pre-1951, which is, increases the risk of it having lead paint with lead hazards. Um, and currently, Cleveland's Department of Health has a backlog of uninvestigated cases where children have been identified as living in a unit that potentially has lead hazards. So what is the, why is lead so harmful? This is actually one of my twin daughters. Um, <laughs> felt comfortable using her picture. Um, the body recognizes the lead as a protein or calcium. It's distributed to the brain, the liver, the kidneys, and the bones. Young children are at particular risk because of the development of their brain and nervous system. Pregnant women are at great risk too because lead that is stored in the bones and the teeth is released into the bloodstream and it exposes the fetus. And lead poisoning during pregnancy can lead to miscarriage, stillbirth, premature birth, and low birth rate. These are the twins now. Um, Lead is mostly usually ingested through lead dust. We hear a lot about lead chips and lead paint chips, um, but kids aren't usually ingesting lead by snacking on a bunch of lead of paint chips. Usually what happens is lead dust or lead paint that has been sometimes covered up is exposed during the friction of opening windows and, and opening and closing doors. That creates a lead dust which covers the surfaces um, and the flooring. And children and babies doing what babies do will um, pick that lead up on their hands, put their hands in their mouth, and, um, and that's how they become lead poisoned. Legal Aid um, has developed a two-prong approach to their legal strategies um, addressing lead poisoning. The first approach is looking at our current laws and using those um, in order to protect more children. And then the second um, prong is really to look at expanding the laws that we currently have. So going to the first prong, um, enforcing current laws, we're doing this through evictions. We file counterclaims, and we also file motions to prohibit re-rental of homes that we know have lead hazards. Um, we're also filing affirmative cases. We're trying to use the rent deposit system, which can be used by anybody who's renting a house and has a condition issue that their landlord is refusing to repair. Um, we're also using the nuisance ordinance, as lead is a nuisance under the Cleveland Code. Um, and we're also pursuing uh, lawsuits under the state lead abatement law. The state lead abatement law um, is triggered when a child is already poisoned by lead. It requires the Department of Health, of Health or a delegated authority to conduct an investigation on where that child lives to find out where that child was exposed to lead hazards. And then they, um, if where they find that lead, they order that remediation be done. When re remediation is not completed, then the law requires that the home be placarded which is a process of putting a notice on the home that basically says the home is unfit for human uh, habitation and is especially risky for um, young children and pregnant women. Legal Aid has filed a lawsuit against the city. Um, we represent a two-year-old child who was poisoned in her rental home. And the lawsuit addresses the city's compliance under the state lead abatement law. Currently, we're waiting for a decision as to whether or not the case will be dismissed or whether it will proceed to trial. So, to be updated later. The second prong, we're really trying to hold landlords accountable and, and seek ways to hold them accountable to remediate lead hazards in their home, um, the homes that they rent. So, to that end, we've drafted a lead safe ordinance that has been introduced to city council. Um, we also are, we've, we're seeking a report on the location of lead poisoning throughout the city and identifying who is most impacted. We're using lawsuits and we're doing education and out, outreach. We're currently looking for more cases where um, parents are renting homes and they think that there possibly are lead hazards and they want their children to, to be protected. 
Um, so what happened to Shanae? Shanae was based actually on two different cases. Um, in the first case, our client, um, her child was actually 10 years old. Um, the child uh, was poisoned. Uh, because the child was 10, the state let abatement law didn't kick in. It kicks in for children six and under. So um, our client stopped paying rent and an eviction was filed. We settled the case eventually. Um, the rent, which um, accumulated to $5,100, was um, she didn't have to pay that, and she also um, she dismissed her case, her lawsuit too. The family has already moved, um, but the thing that was most significant in the case was that we filed a motion to prohibit uh, re-rental based on a report that we had done by an, a lead risk assessor. That lead risk assessment showed that this was one of the most poisoned houses that this assessor had ever seen. There was lead everywhere. And we turned that in as part of our motion to prohibit re-rental. And the court said, everything else can settle, but we have this before us. We know about it now, so we can't ignore it. And so they did conduct an investigation. The second um, case, the child um, was six months when they moved in. And the mother, upon learning that there were potential lead hazards, didn't let her child crawl on the floor. She would sometimes put down um, laundered blankets and sheets that she would let the child crawl around on. But in the time period in which she contacted legal aid and where she was looking to find new housing, um, she didn't let the child crawl. She has she's, um, got out of her lease and has moved. And we are still considering additional claims. So. My message to you all is to keep the pressure on. There needs to be change. Um, the, houses, the homes in which our children reside should not be poisoning them. Good morning. I feel joyful and sobered to be part of this panel, part of this conference with all of these people uh, uh, caring about the children in Cleveland uh, and sobered by the extent of the problems that we face. Um, uh, it is uh, important to remember as we uh, go through these presentations that poverty is not a unitary phenomenon. Um, individual level poverty has an effect on health, but so does area level poverty, not just how rich or poor you are, but how, what the income is in the area that you live, uh, and income inequality, which is dominated by the lack of opportunity in education, the first uh, item on your survey, uh, swipe survey today, and racism, the second. And the combination of those two uh, really have this profound impact on uh, our neighborhoods and uh, violence in the city of Cleveland. Um, it is essential to remember that it doesn't really matter, uh, as we heard the statistics earlier, that the poverty rate in Cleveland is 35% and the child poverty rate is 50% if the poverty rate in your neighborhood is 80%. We um, uh, are happy to be part of this panel in seeking solutions to some of the problems that um, uh, we're uh, faced with. And our uh, particular presentation today focuses on a program that we implemented last summer, um, uh, seeking primary prevention through peer educators in Cleveland recreation centers. We utilized uh, primary and secondary violence prevention programs, trained teen leaders from uh, recreation centers chosen by those recreation centers centers in an intensive training uh, that um, uh, taught them violence prevention, uh, evidence-based violence prevention modules. Uh, they then went back to their recreation centers and taught those violence prevention modules uh, to uh, their uh, peers, near peers. Um, uh, near peers refer to the age group adjacent to our peer teachers. Uh, if peers teach peers, it doesn't feel like teaching, it feels like preaching. But if peers teach near peers, just the age group adjacent to them, it definitely feels like um, teaching because they are now where these younger peers want to be. 
The Community Preventive Services Task Force does recommend universal school-based violence prevention programs. Uh, we sought to apply these principles in a, a novel setting of um, uh, recreation centers. Um, uh, we have been advocates for uh, treating the recreation centers as oasises for kids in the city of Cleveland, where they can come, uh, feel supported, feel mentored, uh, and uh, uh, entertained, uh, and physically active. Um, I'm very happy to say that uh, that advocacy um, uh, that is uh, supported also by Gabriella Celeste, uh, Andrew Garner, another faculty associate in the uh, Schubert Center, and others, uh, led by Dwayne Deskins, um, uh, has resulted in a, um, a public health uh, approach to uh, violence prevention in the city of Cleveland for the first time ever um, uh, and includes everything from primary prevention to tertiary uh, prevention. Our program structure uh, recognized that there are 22 community rec centers in Cleveland, uh, one kid from each rec center, uh, intensive training of the uh, uh, peer leaders. Uh, they went back to the recreation centers uh, and uh, essentially um, uh, presented on a weekly basis after having gone through their own intensive uh, training. Uh, our sharp teens were 10 uh, females and 12 male participants, uh, three students identified as Hispanic Latino, 16 African American, three multiracial, three white. Um, uh, uh, most of the kids um, got A's and B's. Uh, their average age was a little over 16, uh, and these kids were employed during this time through the city rec centers. Um, they delivered 70 sessions to 710 rec center participants uh, during our process. I'm gonna pause at this slide for a minute. Um, uh, we utilized what are referred to as six-word memoirs, a teaching technique um, uh, uh, advocated um, uh, by um, uh, many. Uh, uh, and you can see, uh, we asked them to describe who they were uh, and how they related to violence. Um, uh, and you'll see both um, uh, tragic kind of uh, six-word memoirs and um, uh, uh, very hopeful uh, ones as well. These are the modules that we uh, taught the kids to present. Uh, we supported them before, during, and after their presentations and uh, recorded the fidelity of their programming. Uh, in our evaluation, we demonstrated uh, that um, there was significant improvement uh, in uh, these knowledge areas um, uh, from pre to post testing. Uh, and a significant difference in the coping skills of the kids who uh, participated in the intensive training, uh, and they brought those skills uh, to the sessions that they taught. We looked at the fidelity with the evidence-based programs uh, presented by the kids, and you can see that um, uh, three of the topics had about 75% uh, percent, um, uh, mean fidelity. Uh, five out of the, um, uh, the presentations had 60% or better, and some didn't go quite as well as we would have liked, um, uh, learning for our next iteration of the program this coming summer. So there were a variety of lessons that we learned uh, from going through this process. First, um, uh, the rec centers are truly a different uh, atmosphere for presentation of these modules than schools are, um, uh, but uh, we found a very receptive audience uh, when it was peers who were doing the teaching. Um, there is a need to augment the intensive training that we did with the SHARP students. We'd like to extend this to a year-round program. We'd like to uh, add parent and community components, uh, greater advocacy among our SHARP students for violence prevention um, uh, in the city and greater visibility for those uh, students who uh, have uh, chosen this uh, pathway. And finally, uh, to support the strategic plan for addressing youth violence as a public health issue. Um, uh, thrilled to say uh, that on Monday this week, uh, uh, the Cleveland Plain Dealer covered um, uh, a story um, uh, stating that uh, recreation centers in Cleveland, uh, uh, all of the staff will now be taught in trauma-informed approaches uh, to uh, working with kids. Um, uh, and it is the, the work of um, uh, people like on this panel uh, that uh, have resulted in that. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. Just well, good morning. Uh, I just want to check my watch. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'm Mokit Zabor, by the way, um, and building the community from the inside out is kind of what I want to um, leave with you. In late years of the 19th century, a religious leader sat under a tree in the country of Senegal, West Africa. It was a regular occurrence for the people in this area to see him sitting quietly under this tree. It was always the same tree. It was during one of these regular visits that the man had an experience that would later be described as spiritual. Uh, this especially as he was a noted teacher in a spiritual tradition. His vision and ex experience was of a tree that had extensive roots and branches and that had significance within the man's spiritual practice. The experience also gave him the charge of building a community that would reflect the objectives of his teaching and beliefs. The name of the city and the vision became known as Tuba and was built in the country of Senegal. It was grown over the, it has grown, I'm sorry, over the years to be the home of more than 500,000 inhabitants and is said to be one of the safest and most peaceful cities in the world. It has a symbolic police force. They don't do anything. Little crime, little crime and none of the troubles that are characteristic of other similarly sized cities. The families that inhabit Tuba located there initially as adherents of its founder, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba's teachings. As the leader of the Mouradine path of Sufism, the, Mur the Murids, as they are called, were the initial inhabitants of the town and were fo focused on the intentional practices of the Sufi tradition in Islam. As such, those early residents were intent on making the formal rites and rituals that marked their practice the foundation of the city's living culture. Sheikh Bama died in 1926, leaving the vision of the city and his Murids to the care of his older sons. The city was later founded in 1927, and it remained as a, a population of less than 100,000 for uh, until the late 1970s. That is uh, around the time, uh, uh, 10 years or so after Senegal got its independence. Uh, after a steady, uh, slow and steady crime, its population peaked at around 500,000. That is the approximate population of Cleveland, Ohio, probably a little less by now, but a city that has been known as the best location in the nation and the mistake on the lake. It is not my intent to compare the city of Cleveland to the city of Tuba, only to illustrate some broad implications of intent, ritual, and its influence on the physical structure and its impact on the human interactional structure. Tuba was founded with an intention to construct a living space that connected its, its inhabitants not only to each other, but also to the spiritual principles being taught. At the center of the city is the Grand Mosque, symbolizing the importance of those practices and principles. It also represents to many the intentional connections between the place and the people. Additionally, the mosque serves as a reminder of the residents, to the residents of their commitment to uphold their teachings. The ruin of a nation begins in the homes of its people. This has guided my work for more than 25 years. I started when I was pretty young uh, and represents the importance, <laughs> importance of place on family and relative to the character and success of the nation within which we live. Home and home training, some know what that means, or, <laughs> or the exercise and expression of what it means to be human is introduced to us by our most intimate and consistent companions, our families. What it means to have uh, my need for affection and attention fulfilled in a positive, enriching way was or was not learned in the home. If my need for this emotional support is fulfilled, I will know how to display them outside the home or into the community and will not have a need to seek them intensely outside the home. However, if my experiences within the home are not adequately fulfilling, I will seek them from my community. If my mom is stressed by her unfulfilled needs and dad has internalized the messages projected about his in inadequacies from the external world, my emotional vulnerabilities will dominate my behavior. When a child displays some inappropriate behaviors and or attitudes, the approach by those in charge has been what's wrong with them, as opposed to questioning what has happened to you. Emotional press has to do with the impact of environmental structures on shaping the behaviors of the human within that environment. 
1938, M.A. Murray, while studying the psychological needs of college students, proposed that behavior is an outcome of the relationship between the person and his or her environment. Additionally, according to Murray, a person's needs are characteristics of their personalities. How the new environments of college campuses impacted the success of minority students and were moving and to those who were moving into those new and unfamiliar places and what they needed psychologically for their success were examined. How this research is or can be used to address the issue at hand, the relationship between the home and the neighborhood will only be teased in this presentation. Teased. The ruin of a nation begins in homes as people is a clear is it is clear that whatever one brings from our family experience will dictate what we do and interpret from and in our outer environment. Most often we are unaware of or under aware of this dynamic. Family, however we are defining it, is the grounding and launching pad of, for our engagement with the broader community. But an environmental press idea is the effect of the press on the emotional needs of those moving within the press. The environmental press of Tuba has an intentional outcome envisioned. I'm told that from wherever you come, when you enter the city, there's a shared experience of peace. Wow, okay. When assessing <laughs> what needs that, that's pretty peaceful, okay. Uh, when assessing what needs to be done in our communities, we must begin in the homes of the people. A true community begins in the hearts of the people involved in it. It is not a place of distraction, but a place of being. It is not a place where you reform, but a place you go home to. Finding a home is what people in a community try and accomplish. In a community, it is possible to restore a supportive presence from one another, rather than distrust of one another or competitiveness with one another. The others in the community are the reason that one feels the way one feels. The elder cannot be an elder if there is no community to make him an elder. The young boy cannot feel secure if there's no elder whose silent presence give him hope for life. The adult cannot be who she is unless there is a strong sense of the other people around. The sense of interdependence or supportive presence is spawned, taught, and nurtured in the home. Okay, getting there. Another of my favorite proverbs, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there defines the primary challenge of the family. What is our accepted purpose? Or who are we as a family? And how do we manage the energy flows within the boundaries of the family to accomplish that purpose? Person to person, male to female, female to female, male to male, and individual to group, and group to individual. Understanding these interdependencies within the family and managing those flows with intent perhaps prepares us to engage with the broader environment by identifying the opportunities for positive engagement. How did I do? Good. It's good. <laughs> all right, let's give another round of applause to all of our panelists. All right, so I'm going to pose a question or two um, to, okay, to the panelists, and then we'll open up to the audience for conversation and comment. Um, two just really quick things, though. Um, that I took away, um, and I'm sure slides will be available after this. Uh, return to Dr. Frank's slide with the six-word memoir. Um, I've never heard of that, so thank you for sharing that. The one that stood out to me um, and really was very sobering was a child who said, no one really cares, no, no one really understands, no one really cares. Um, and it reminded me of my question that I posed to you all um, in the beginning is, how do we reclaim the destiny of our children? No child should ever have to utter those words. Um, and it's really sobering. Um, the entire presentation or slate of presentations today um, made it clear to me and I hope to each of you that programmatic solutions alone will not ameliorate these issues. The issues laid out by our esteemed panelists did not happen overnight. They are a result of systemic and structural racist policies that have and continue to penetrate our society. They're multifaceted, as Suma said, um, and wickedly complex. It's clear, and it was clear in each of the presentations today, that place matters. There's value in people and understanding people, the human-centered nature of this work. 
Um, I love data, I love research, and it, it is well needed, um, but it has to be interwoven in with the face that's behind these data points. And each of the panelists today did a great job elevating the value of people. Over the course of time today and in other facets of academia and other sort of think tanks, um, there have been much research and case studies detailing these type of issues over time as it relates to children and neighborhoods. Um, some quick examples, uh, the Moving to Opportunity Project that came out a number of years ago, Harlan Children's Zone, Promise Zones, Choice Neighborhoods, um, and most recently, the Equality Opportunity Project. So we have great data and we have great examples, um, both at the national level as well as the local level as we heard today. So my first question to the panelists is, how do we take all the data, the research, and information that you shared today and move this conversation towards creating an equitable Cleveland for our children? Anyone can kick it off. Easy question. That's how I like to come, you know. <laughs> um, I think we really have to work on being honest about our collaborations. Um, oftentimes when we're talking about, oh, stand up? Oh, OK. Oftentimes when we're getting it, when we're in a room like this and we want to identify challenges, we go to the challenges that we individually know, right? And we are each strong advocates around those challenges and what needs to happen. So it's kind of hard to come to a consensus because you want your challenge addressed. So we really have to be honest about coming together in a consensus matter, not voting who's right and who's wrong, but really recognizing a mission that says, it goes back to the question, how do we make it better for our children? So I think we really have to focus on pulling those collaborations stronger together and creating even capacity for maybe some of the partners in that collaboration so that we can do that work together. Thank you. Any other panelists want to respond to that? Dr. Frank? I'll uh, uh, respond uh, briefly as well. Um, uh, I think the emphasis that I would place uh, is on two things. One uh, is embracing complexity. Uh, we try to simplify these issues as if um, uh, they're dichotomous or, or one side or another, when in fact, uh, if we seek to solve the problems that face our kids, we have to embrace the complexity of those problems uh, as a community and particularly as advocates uh, for our youth. Um, the second is a different way to understand uh, the issue that's been described as trust, and that is um, uh, a, an approach that you can, uh, that we refer to as mutual empowerment. Um, uh, we talk about empowering the community when in fact we have no capacity to do that unless the community empowers us to do so. Um, uh, and we far too often um, forget that um, uh, issue and uh, lose our cultural <laughs> humility as we uh, don't seek to um, uh, confirm that the community is willing to empower us to uh, uh, to help uh, make the changes that are necessary for the community. Did you peek at my questions? Because that was a real good segue to my next one, <laughs> Dr. Frank. Uh, so thank you. Um, so to just build upon what Dr. Frank just shared, equitable community development occurs when the people most impacted are at the table and contributing to the solution. So the next question before we open up to the audience, how do you suggest we organize the collective power of our children, youth, parents, and key stakeholders to help foster a shared vision for change? So we heard you know, one of the things that we need to do is to be honest about our collaborations, embrace complexity, understand trust, but now it's how do we move toward the, the do, right? Not just talking about, um, but actually bring these organic folks together in a collective way. I think one way is um, through reevaluating our research techniques, so making children the center of the research process and not just the subjects of it, um, such as through child participation research, where their voice is actually meaningful and recognized, and they're recognized as people in their own right. Thank you. Uh, there is a... We want to see you. 
mean host. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you didn't hear that. Anyway, uh, so there's a, 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 I guess you call it a system that I'm familiar with that um, is called Kandizi. Kandizi is a way of um, fostering the culture of the village, so to speak. It begins, it is, and, and it, it, the, the English translation is babysitting. Every human being born in this system is, at, by the time they reach age five, is responsible for the next person. I, you, you had a word for it, I can't remember what it was. Anyway, uh, uh, the, the next person coming along. And that continues from the time they're five until they no longer exist within the community. So it, it, it fosters a number of things, best of which is the cultural, the continuation of the culture, which means that if the cultures continue and everyone is given this, the not same, but similar kinds of introductions and processes through which they pass in this culture, then the culture will remain primarily intact and have the ability to adapt to what is, what the changes in the environment uh, allude to. How that would happen in Cleveland, we'd have to begin that conversation. I don't know if any of our lifetimes would be, have that, you know, see that come to pass. But if we don't do it now, when will we? For sure. Great. Thank you so much. Please, Abby. So as, a, as an attorney, I see this through my attorney lens. And I've learned so much today from my fellow panelists. Um, so, but I can't help but respond from my attorney lens. I think a lot of what needs to happen is um, the stabilization of families in their communities. Um, there's so much um, instability in housing because of our rental stock that um, families are moving at a very high rate and children move from um, one school system to another school system three, four times in a year. And this also is leading to um, falling behind in their education, in addition to all of these other factors that we've heard about today. It also um, really deteriorates our communities. When you're moving into a new house every four, five, six months, you don't have a chance to get to know your neighbors and to rely on them and to support each other and to build the community and the connections that really make a stable, um, a stable community. So to that end, um, you know, we at Legal Aid are uh, working on a right to counsel project. Um, the, the idea is that um, there are so few tenants that are represented in evictions and, and many tenants don't know their rights. So um, for example, in Cleveland, there's about 10,000 evictions a year and about 1% of those tenants are represented. Um, and if we were able to provide representation for more tenants and instead of having to move, their, their housing is stabilized and they're able to stay home and um, they're able to defend their right to stay in their unit, that this will contribute to the stabilization of communities um, and is an important part of the picture. For sure. Thank you, Abigail. All right, let's get a couple of uh, the voices in the room to our panelists. This young lady in the back here. So to piggyback kind of on what you just mentioned, one of my questions and kind of a statement in the midst of it also is the importance of making the social and emotional wellness of our children as important as their academic progress. I'm a speech pathologist. I work in the Euclid City Schools. And what we've been, my fellow speech pathologists actually went to the other room. That's where I belong, but I'm glad I stayed here. Um, what we've been trying to push in our academic setting is not making the first two weeks about academics at all, because the kids just are not ready to learn yet. And what we're seeing is an influx of behavior. So how do we teach them what's appropriate without having the expectation that we know, um, that we believe that they should know how to behave? Um, so we talked about making sure we look at their social, emotional, 
what's going on, what is at the root of the behaviors that we're seeing, because being in, in the academic setting and also taking my children to the Salvation Army in the afternoons, that's where they go to aftercare, what we're seeing is an influx of what we'll call negative behaviors, the cursing, the talking back, the disrespect, that kind of thing. I guess my question then is, what can we do to better support our children, so, um, I'm sorry, socially and emotionally before we look at the academic piece of it? Well, I, <clears throat> I will say that your exact approach that you just shared with us about taking that two week period to really see how to get into education by first seeing what the child is bringing to the table is kind of what I was trying to explain with Ubuntu, is that you have to see the person. And we tend to prescribe because we know better, right? So when a child comes to school, we know better, so I'm going to educate you from the minute you walk into the door. But what are you feeling? What is the origin of your behavior? Why are you showing up in the way that you're showing up? Right? And that takes time, people. And it's, and it's difficult in an age where we're trying to microwave outcomes. So, but we have to take the time to see people and really understand who they are and what they're bringing to the table. And that sometimes for some of us, it may be something you cannot relate to, right? You don't have any experience that equates to the experience of that child. But we can't continue to ask people to pull themselves up by their bootstrap when they don't have shoe strings, right? So we have to see the person. We have to see the child. We have to see the family is connected to. And we have to make sure that that community is ready to support in any way that we can. Thank you, Soma. We have a question here in the front. Over here. Oh. Yeah. Oh, am I yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I was wondering if any of you had any long longitudinal data data to share about the impact of elevated lead levels in the young people as far as their future potential interactions in the juvenile justice system or in special education services, and um, if you have any suggestions for interrupting those sort of outcomes. I mean, you're 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 right on uh, on schedule with the thinking here, and there's there is very limited. Uh, hard research on this topic, tracking children over longitudinally based on lead exposure. But that is that is our intent here. We do have uh, data on juvenile uh, court involvement for children, We're, but we can only, tr we have to track enough cohorts in order to get stable estimates. And I would just, I would just say, it'll, it'll probably show what you expect. You'll see m more prevalence of showing up in these systems that are based on perhaps issues of executive function, uh, behavioral concerns, as, as we were just mentioned. And the question is, compared to what? Uh, we can compare to kids who had no confirmed lead exposure. We can compare to kids who had no lead test. And in, in our study, 15% of children in these cohorts that we looked at got to kindergarten without a lead test ever. Um, and those kids seem to have results similar to those kids that had a positive lead test. Um, they just, we didn't know it. So I, I think the, this, this will play out. Uh, but in terms of the policy issue and the, the leadership around this, does it help us better understand how these children came to be in these spaces and places and maybe have more compassion and ownership for what we've allowed to happen? I hope so. But we still have the practical matter of dealing with the behaviors as they emerge in these various systems. And those systems are largely designed to not perhaps diagnose what caused it, but address it in its current form. And I think uh, this has to happen on two levels. So I pre we, we want to get there with the data, but I, I don't want to pretend like the data are going to tell us what to do, the, the people in leadership, the advocates with good data can help us get to where we need to be, I hope. We're going to take two more questions we have here in the front in blue and then the young woman in red. 
It's a similar question or same topic. I'm wondering um, for Abigail, if filing a lawsuit against the city of Cleveland is the answer or is it against the paint companies that caused the poison to happen at the beginning? Well, that's... Can you hear me? Abigail, stand up. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, that's a, it's a really good question. Um, and that litigation against paint companies has um, been tried in other states and failed. Um, it, they um, started it in Ohio a few years back, but because it didn't um, proceed favorably in Rhode Island, they stopped that pursuit. That being said, recently in California, um, a, a, a jury found three paint companies responsible for um, a public nuisance, and the court, along with the jury, um, ordered the three paint companies to remit to investigate and remediate the all all of the pre 1950 homes, 1951 homes, in 10 different jurisdictions. So seven cities and three counties. That um, most recently in February, the Supreme Court in um, California refused to review that judgment, which means that the judgment stands. So it's an interesting question. Um, to be continued. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Our last question, this woman here in the red. Thank you. Two very unrelated questions. One should be. Can you speak up, ma'am? Um, Thank you. What is the remediation for lead in the home? There's sort of two different levels. There's um, a remediation that would make a home lead safe, and then there's remediation that would make a home lead free. So lead free is what it sounds like. All lead is removed. So that means any surface that has lead paint on it either has to be scraped of that lead paint, um, that lead paint must be removed, any um, exposed dirt that has lead, paint, lead dust in it outside of the house has to be removed. All lead paint, all lead hazards have to be removed. Lead safe is a lesser um, standard. It's basically encapsulating where lead paint may exist. So it's, it's cleaning the surface and then um, painting over it in a prescribed way in order to reduce greatly the um, risk of exposure. Do you have more to add? Uh, I would just say, you know, we, we have to also acknowledge there's the structural element, but then there is the maintenance by families. And in a study that the, the city of Cleveland, uh, a program that they launched that we studied, it was doing this uh, low cost abatement coupled with parent training, who, parents of children, uh, to train them in how to uh, um, effectively clean using a HEPAVAC and other procedures to keep the lead dust, uh, lead dust to a minimum. And in that study, it just it reinforced the, the challenge with, with that the parents face in, in doing that effectively. These were single-headed households for the most part with small children. Uh, it, were the homes uh, cleaned well? Generally, yes, but it did not uh, remove, it did not keep the lead dust to the, the minimum that was found right after the abatement. Thank you. Ma'am, I'm sorry, we're actually out of time, uh, but the panelists will be available for a few moments, uh, but we have to transition to lunch. So I have a couple of closing announcements. Um, I'm gonna allow each of our panelists to share a checkout word or three-word three, three word phrase. Um, so start thinking about that, uh, just sort of what are you leaving this room with? Um, and while they are thinking about that word, uh, <laughs> I will share some final announcements. Um, so thanks again for joining us this morning. Uh, lunch is now about to happen. Please stay at your tables um, as the room opens up to accommodate for the City Club audience. Um, Schubert Center students will direct you to the table to get up um, and make sure you bring your lunch ticket. Uh, just a reminder, restrooms are available either uh, immediately to the right when you walk out this room um, or downstairs. Uh, so for our checkout word, we will start with Dr. Fisher. Just one word or you said three words? You can all go up to three, <laughs> but that's it. Okay. 
as an ac as an academic, I, I will, I will so use hard. my one word to cite a much longer set of words. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not fair. No, I think my my takeaway is uh, the import get early childhood and housing together. <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm about to discipline y'all like I do my students. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Youth economic success. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Ubuntu. <laughs> For the win. <laughs> um, keep the pressure on. Collective impact. Hip Kaihoga. Um, I am because we are. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs>